What's your favorite travel show? Anthony Bourdain, Rick Steves, one of the Travel Channel shows. Well, starting in January, you'll have a new favorite, and it will be on PBS. Ernest White II is the host of that show, which is called Fly Brother, and Ernest is here with me today to talk about travel, Fly Brother, and even his re recent trip to the Cannes Film Festival. So don't go anywhere. Matthew Felix on Air starts now. Welcome to Matthew Felix on Air, people who create, people who make a difference, coming to you from Wordspace Studios in San Francisco, California. Hope you had a great week. My big news uh, last week was the interview that I did with CBS News travel editor Peter Greenberg about my book, Porcelain Travels. The interview was for his Eye on Travel radio show, and I actually did the interview in April, but it just aired nationwide uh, last Saturday with the archived version going live last Wednesday. It was really fun uh, trading bathroom stories with Peter. He actually had quite a few of his own to share, so that was fun, and just getting to talk about my book, of course. And uh, if you want to check out the interview, you can uh, find the link on my website, matthewfelix.com, or, of course, on Peter's website, petergreenberg.com, and you can check out the May 25th episode. Speaking of Porcelain Travels, a new uh, episode of my Porcelain Travels podcast is out this Thursday, and that episode is a short excerpt from my recent live one-man show, where I talk about my minuscule Barcelona studio, which had a very, very unique setup. And you can listen to that episode and all the previous episodes. That one's pretty short, like I said. Uh, but you can listen to that and all the previous ones on my website or on most major podcast platforms. In other news, I mention every week that uh, Wordspace Studios is offering writing residencies, and, uh, and Wordspace Studios, of course, being where, where I do this podcast. Well, last week, Patricia Rareg became the latest writer to arrive for residency. Patricia came all the way from Paris, France, no less, and she's currently working on a novel, and among other places, her work has been featured in Aaron Burns' vignettes and postcards from Paris Anthology. So this Wednesday, June 5th, from 7 o'clock to 8.30 here at Wordspace Studios, Patricia and Aaron will be in discussion. Um, they'll talk about Literary Paris, about the vignettes and postcards, anthology, writing in general, and much, much more. So if you're local to San Francisco or the Bay Area, please come check it out. That, again, is this Wednesday, June 5th, from 7 o'clock to 8.30. Some reminders about my upcoming shows. No show next week, but the following Sunday, June 16th, my guest will be author Rachel Howard. Rachel is a fiction writer. She writes personal essays, memoir, and also dance criticism. Her debut novel, The Risk of Us, is just out, and I just started reading it uh, the past two hours before the show because it just came in the mail. Not today, but yesterday came in the mail. And um, I've been drawn right in. This is uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to continuing continuing to read the book. Uh, her first book, though, was a memoir. It was called The Lost Night, and it's, um, she was interviewed by Ira Glass on This American Life about that book. Her work has also appeared in O Magazine, The New York Times uh, Magazine, The Los Angeles Review of Books, and elsewhere. So I cannot wait to have Rachel on the show, and that again is June 16th. On June 30th, my last show before my summer hiatus, I will have uh, Guide Dogs for the Blind CEO and President Christine Benninger. And as I mentioned last week, I regularly babysit for a my canine nephew, Finn, who those of you who are watching can see in the picture. And that's kind of a <laughs> – I love that picture. Finn was a good sport for that picture. Those of you who are, are listening and can't see the picture, it's, it's on my, my, um, my Instagram feed. He was a good sport, like I said, for that photo. But, um, but Finn, it turned out, wasn't, wasn't well-suited to be a guide dog. And he, he underwent what is called a, a career change. But um, – but that's how I first got exposed to Guide Dogs for the Blind. And then they also, they train their dogs in San Rafael. And so I see them a lot over the years. I've seen them training the dogs in San Rafael. And so I've wondered for a long time just about the organization and just curious to learn more. So I was really excited that Chris agreed to be on the show. And that again will be on June 30th. Before we get to today's show, I want to say congratulations to Cara Black, who was on my show, I don't know, two or three months ago, not three months ago, not, not too long ago. She, of course, is the author of the Aimé Le Duc series, which is a, a mystery series that takes place in Paris. Cara had the launch party for her 19th book, 
today at uh, Corda at uh, Book Passage in Corda Madeira. The book is called Murder in Bel Air, and it's out this Tuesday, June fourth. It's gotten great reviews from Publishers Weekly and Booklist. So, uh, congrats again to Kara. And if you're into to mystery novels, that is one to pick up for sure. Okay, after this quick message from my host and sponsor, Wordspace Studios, we'll be back to talk with producer and host of the upcoming PBS travel show, Fly Brother, Ernest White II. A quick thanks to Wordspace Studios in San Francisco for sponsoring Matthew Felix on Air. Wordspace's mission is to bring together writers and thinkers of all ages and experiences. Wordspace will soon be offering creative writing workshops, a literary book club, and guided writing groups. And Wordspace is already offering writing residencies. They are submission-based, and they provide writers with room and board for up to one month. To find out more, you can email info at wordspacestudios.com. Ernest White II is a storyteller and explorer who has circumnavigated the globe six times. Did I say that right? Circumnavigated the globe six times. He is the producer and host of television travel docuseries Fly Brother, host of the travel and culture-focused Fly Brother radio show, and publisher of multicultural travel portal flybrother.net. Ernest's writing has been featured in Time Out London, USA Today, Ebony, Matador Network, National Geographic Travelers Brazil, and Bratz Tajikistan Guidebooks, as well as on TravelChannel.com. Ernest is also senior editor at Panorama, the Journal of Intelligent Travel, former assistant editor at Time Out Sao Paulo, and founding editor of Digital Men's, Digital Men's Magazine, Abernathy. Ernest has appeared on the Travel Channel television series Destination Showdown and Jamaica Baird, as well as in the 2013 documentary film about the dangers of mass tourism, Gringo Trails. Welcome, Ernest. Thank you, man. Where's the applause? <laughs> Can't you hear it? You know what? In all seriousness, I did think when I had more ambitions before I realized that I was already taking on enough with the cameras and, and all that stuff, I actually did was thinking about like having canned applause just okay, for certain. Yeah. I thought that that would be kind of funny. It would have been, been funny. But, but then it's like I have... People can't see, and you can't see, obviously, but right now I'm looking at five different screens okay. to do what we're doing right now. And so... An extra screen would have been An extra screen, too and much. then... Yeah. Doing the most. Yeah, like I said, with the three cameras and the sound. Yeah. And, but maybe when I have a production team like you do, which we're going to talk about, you actually have people behind the scenes making, <laughs> That's making true. your That's films true. happen. So maybe you can give me some pointers on how to do that but yeah for My now minions. for now it's just us clapping all right well you, if you can't clap for yourself how can you clap that's for right. somebody else that's right uh-oh uh-oh, uh -oh. uh -oh. bring it back bring, bring it back, it back. Sing bring it back, back. there bring we go back. okay <laughs> bring it back to me okay so you and i met <laughs> several weeks ago not even several what was it three weeks ago it was may i it mean was the end of I'm april, sorry, april, april 11th yeah. april 11th so what's today 2019 yeah today so I, I guess it's been like six weeks yeah June anyway point being very recently and at Arid, Aaron Burns uh, lit, lit Wings event in Paris. Yay, Aaron. And then mere, yes, yay, Aaron, Thank who you. hopefully will be tuning in here shortly. And then mere weeks later, you returned to France to go to the Cannes Film Festival. Yes. From which you have now just returned. Um, so how was that? How was the Cannes Film Festival? Oh, wow. Uh, the festival was incredible. Had you um, been before? I had never been before. It was my first time. I was there as the MC and moderator of several panels for a tent called the Pavillon Afrique. Mm -hmm. um, it was a tent in the Marché du, Fi uh, yeah, Marché du Film, which is kind of a, an the area. Film marketplace. It's the film marketplace. It's where countries and film bodies kind of have tents that are, that facilitate interaction exchange between filmmakers producers financiers anyone in the industry and the pavillon afrique for the very first time was kind of a place for filmmakers and producers from the continent of africa as well as the diaspora to come together and just create yeah. you know visual yeah. storytelling and so i was there as one of the mcs and so, so this wasn't specifically about your own your own shows. This was it was big, not specifically because I had a show, but I was tapped to do it because I have a show. I yeah. suppose. Yeah. Um. And yeah. So that's kind of how I ended okay. up great wrangled in there. So what? It's a good place to get wrangled into. That's very true. Um. So what sort of panels did you did you lead? What were some of the topics? Um. Some of the topics were interacting how to pitch for example something uh, okay. so it so went from basic related, yeah. it was definitely business related uh -huh. um there were also introductory panels uh not introductory uh so much it, not introductory in the sense of like first timers but introductory panels for meet filmmakers meeting 
producers, meeting people who were active in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the people that we had as guests were folks who operate cinemas in West Africa, mm, who represent governmental bodies that uh, provide financing for film and television projects. Mm -hmm. Young filmmakers from not only the continent, but Europe doing stories about being of African descent in countries like France and Belgium and Germany. Yeah. Uh, and then people from the U.S. and Brazil and uh, Haiti, Jamaica. They were yeah. all the, the uh, commissioner for the Jamaican Film Board was there. The uh, yeah, it, it, there was a lot of interesting people. I feel like I'm the only one who wasn't there. Well, next year. we. But would then I don't have, have a lot of heritage that would probably get me into that pavilion. But it doesn't matter so far because as, yeah. like, well, we're a very welcoming. People, OK, good. Matthew. Okay, <laughs> so good. just show up. Okay. Man. We want everyone to feel at home okay that sounds that sounds like you must have made so many amazing connections i, I did yeah um I did, yeah I did man. you did but it's not it's a trick what question we, it, yeah. it's what we do in the world man. yeah you, you go out you show up as an authentic person you engage you interact you uh open yourself up you become vulnerable and permeable and you end up connecting with people amen now the most important question about <laughs> okay. ken did you see any stars? Uh, only the one in the mirror. Oh, I'm joking. Man. Oh, he's feeling Actually, good, people. He's so, feeling good, people. well, you know, again, man, you have to. If you are, you do your have biggest your own TV fan, show. Hey, that's true. But if you're not supporting yourself, if you're not giving yourself that talk, so then true. how can you expect other people to do it? Um, yes. I very did true. interact with some very interesting um, French and Haitian and African celebrities and stars mm -hmm. and personalities, mm -hmm. uh, but. Any like American names, I can't really rattle off just because I didn't see many of them. Yeah, yeah. I was outside of that well, sphere. Yeah, but you know what? That, and that's interesting because I had Zoe Elton. Actually, she's been on my show twice. Okay. She's the director of programming for the Mill Valley Film Festival. Oh, wow. And I asked her that question, of course, half joking, not half joking. And she had a similar comment because, you know, she's there looking for films, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so, of course, she goes to some of the premieres, and I'm sure yes. she's been on or, you know, at some of the red carpets and things. But, but her point was, was similar, though. Yeah, even though that's going on, she's there working. Correct. And there's a lot of work to be done, and they're in different spaces. So you don't – it's not as if if you go to Cannes, you're necessarily rubbing elbows with all the big stars. You might. But, True. Um, and the thing is, it, I've, I heard people talk about it. You know, people who would come to Cannes for 20 years, 25 years. Back then, yeah. you would be eating at a terrace. It's more intimate. And, exactly. I yeah. mean, now there's security concerns. And it's oh, just yeah. so the, the nature of celebrity is different. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, I, I did get the chance to interview the director, Mira Nair. Mm. And that was an incredible experience. And, and why is that? Just because I've been a fan of her since I was in high school when uh -huh. Mississippi Masala came out. Oh, uh -huh. And she directed most recently Queen of Katwe. She's working on a new film now. They had a screening of Queen of Katwe, which was about a young chess champion from Uganda. And Lupita Nyong'o played her mother. Uh -huh. uh, it was a Disney no, film. I just read something about that. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, so they had a screening, and then I was asked to do the Q&A afterwards. Oh, great. And so I was yeah. trying to hold it together because yeah. I don't really... You don't want to seem star starstruck. Or I, I, I I didn't mostly didn't want to seem starstruck. I yeah. wanted to seem a little bit starstruck because like respectfully, I, certainly yeah. respectfully yeah. starstruck. Yeah, yeah. Because I think on some level, people who are doing great work should know how it impacts sure. people. Absolutely. You know, and so the thing that made me starstruck about her has was the intelligence of her work, the importance of the stories that she tells, which are all about empowerment you mm -hmm. know women's empowerment men's empowerment people of color you know visibility as empowerment right, and right. she's done that uh, you know beyond her own background and heritage as a woman from india <laughs> you know and the other interesting thing was that she started in front of the camera and ended mm. up becoming uh, this force and powerhouse behind the camera yeah. so I, I was starstruck yeah what a wonderful opportunity yes well, I'm glad you had an amazing time in Cannes. I'm sure we could talk lots more about that, um, but, <laughs> but we're not going <laughs> to because we got yeah. If you remember anything, having only been back three days and, yeah, and jet lagged, and yeah, and for me, we were talking about this before before the show started. For me, my jet lag is worse three days later. Mm. Like I have a couple days where I'm okay, yes, and then it just hits me, okay. and then for a couple days, I don't know. But you <laughs> said you you had some other stops on your way back, so your acclimation. That's true. I don't know how yours is going. All right, but. Speaking of Q&A sessions, so for anyone who's watching, um, not if you're listening, because if you're listening, it's already recorded, but if you're watching live, uh, Ernest is up for taking questions at the end. So if you have questions about his show, which we're about to talk about, the Cannes Film Festival, about travel in general, uh, jot them down, keep them in mind, and at the end, um, if there are any questions, he will uh, 
generously has generously agreed to field them. All right. So thanks for talking about Ken, but let's talk about the main subject here, which is Fly Brother. Mm. And when I say Fly Brother, um, we're going to talk specifically about the show, but Fly Brother is also more than just the show. So like yes. I said, that is going to kind of be the focus. But you have uh, a TV show, the radio show, online magazine. You do trips. You're not. Some of this has been put a little bit to the side while you focused on the show. Certainly. But Fly Brother is an umbrella of, of those things and probably some things I didn't mention. So can you tell us at a high level... What is Fly Brother? Fly Brother is all about transformational lifestyle design. You know, it's about stepping out into the world, like I mentioned before, and just engaging, just becoming your fullest self and finding that in others as well. We're all out here together on this planet. You know, teamwork makes the dream work. For me, it's about connecting with people. That is what I am most passionate about in life. When I travel, when I'm home, I enjoy seeing myself through the eyes of others mm -hmm. and that is kind of what I that 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 feeling that experience of recognition that's mm -hmm. what you feel when you're in love it's what you feel when you are interacting with your best friends with your family that you know the people that you really care about or even an amazing interaction with a stranger with an animal that you you love you know a pet with with totally. it, the environment you know it's just recognition and so that on a very high level, that's kind of what Fly Brother is all about. It's about getting out into the world, showing the world that you are a part of it, showing the world that you belong out there. Because when you do go out there, when you believe that you belong in the world, the world will show you that you belong in it. So I love it. Thank you. Yeah. OK. And so a lot of the a lot of when we say going out to the world in this context, mm. I know you're talking in general. Yes. Sort of a, yes a personal level, but we're also talking when we talk about Fly Brother, the show and the radio show and the, and the online magazine, you're specifically travel is sort of under the common denominator also certainly, in, certainly. A, in a more sort of pragmatic sense. Yes. So when did you start traveling? I started traveling when I was, I started traveling physically to other places. Physically to other places. Yeah. <laughs> we can get really metaphysical. Certainly. I don't know when you started having out of body experiences. Uh, well, but yeah, <laughs> I, when I was a very young child, I mean, I was always, uh, drawn to literature and right. film and through the imagination certainly yeah. books about I, uh, my parents were educators mm -hmm. we always had books around I was a lover of literature and of reading and so that was how I first started sure. traveling through yeah. music too yeah. you know my parents were are classically trained musicians as well as educators so uh, to hear music from around the world and then ask my parents where that was from or what instrument that was. I remember Peter and the Wolf being one of my favorites to listen to as a kid because mm -hmm. it was just very impressionistic, right? Yeah. Literally impressing images in my mind mm -hmm. or on my mind. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of where the the fertile ground for Seeds travel planted. exactly yeah. 100% i yeah. was always drawn to my favorite subject in school was geography mm -hmm. i was always drawn to other languages and to flags and costumes and architecture and things of things like that you no, know I, I think that's a really good point i mean i think that's a really good point so much of our travels even our our literal travels start in our imaginations. A hundred percent. And that's what, that's the beauty of literature. That's the beauty of film. That's the beauty of these things that they do transport us. They are transportative. Yes. That's they right are right. transportative. And, and then oftentimes it can again, plant the seeds and then we actually go do it. We physically go yes. to other places. And so to answer that question, yeah. the first time I, I, the first time I did a trip by myself, let's say, because sure. I went with my parents to the Bahamas when I was in, I don't know, maybe 12 or 11 or something like that. The Bahamas being another one of Florida's counties. Uh -huh. and I'm from Florida. So, uh -huh. okay. Um, but okay. when I was... I don't know. I was a... Uh, sorry. I was a um, a foreign exchange student when oh, I was you were? 16 years old. So was I. In Where'd Sweden. You go? In Sweden. Yes, oh. I went to Sweden. Um, okay. And it was a life-forming experience for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I was 16... The way that came about was, you know, I'd seen in, in movies where people hosted a foreign exchange student. And so I asked my parents, could we host a student? And they yeah. were like, uh, no. But you can go. But you can go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. I ended up going through Youth for Understanding uh, mm -hmm. International Exchange. Uh -huh. And Sweden was, along with Finland, one of the cheapest of the programs that you could go on. Which really? at that time That's in 1994, it was like $2,500 all mm. included. 
Um, you don't think of Sweden and Finland being cheap today? Well, certainly, but the program back then, or the program itself, the program was yeah. cheap. I don't yeah. know. I don't remember what the economy looks like. Right. Um, but in terms of the program fee, right. And it was also one of the countries that didn't require language beforehand because they speak English. Correct. Somewhere. Yeah. So I didn't have to have like three years of Spanish or three years of French. Right. right. Um, and so I ended up going to Sweden. It was a phenomenal experience for the whole year. I was no, I was just there for the summer between okay. my junior summer. and senior yeah. year of high school. Yeah. And, you know, I had gone I had gone to an all black high school in a very segregated part of the south and the, on the north side of Jacksonville, Florida. So very similar <laughs> to the experience that you had in Sweden. It, exactly. <laughs> it was just like. Uh -huh. Well, here's the interesting thing. Yeah. My high school was an all black high school and it was opened in 1965 as an all black high school during segregation. But the mascot was the Viking. <laughs> because it's on the north side of town a little bit of trolling uh -huh. school uh -huh. for <laughs> interesting yeah okay well i apparently or maybe it was a little bit of a prophetic because you ended up up there. i suppose so man. yeah okay so so sweden was really first when sort of the gates opened and was that it after that you just started traveling uh, exactly right uh i would say probably three or four years later i ended up going to the dominican republic through my undergraduate university did a study abroad there um, and then anytime I got the chance, and this is the late 90s into the early 2000s, I would hop on a flight deal, you know, and, and right. this was Just when happen. things were shifting to, you know, from like uh, the, the airline industry was shifting from telephone, telephony to digital and, and websites and everything like that. So More we were kind of being able to take easier. advantage of yep. lower f fares that were offered directly to the customer without having to go through a travel agent. Yep. So when did you shift from, hey, I really love to travel, this is great, to I want to make this my livelihood, I want to make this the focus of what I'm doing? Um, it was a slow but steady transformation. After I finished graduate school, or while I was in graduate school, um, I went to American University. I went first, plug, to my uh -huh. undergraduate university, Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. Okay, there it is. An HBCU, Historically Black College. Okay. Uh, I studied political science, uh -huh. and then I went to graduate school in Washington, D.C. at American University and got my MFA in creative writing. Uh -huh. During that time, I had living in D.C., you know, it was the early to mid 2000s it is it was then and it still is a very a very international city so it was easy to go to social events at the embassies to meet people from different parts of the world and you always got really good flight deals and so getting into the habit of traveling kind of helped foment the idea that I should be doing this if not professionally at least as full time as I could make it. Yep. And so after I, one of the perks of getting an MFA at the time, terminal degree then, yeah. was a teaching certificate. Uh -huh. And that allowed me to go overseas and teach. So that was kind of how I ended up making travel a full time presence in my life. Right. And then it slowly shifted over the next decade from being an education focused um, professional life mm -hmm. to journalism. Yep. And uh, that's kind of also how I made travel my business. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So, again, I'm sure there's a whole other show there, the whole actual trajectory, because there are so many different interesting things along the way. So, but what we're going to do is fast forward sure. to Fly Brother. Okay. And, but again, we're still not going to get to the show, although that is going to be the focus. But I want to hear about the radio show, because when I was re researching for today, I didn't know that you also had a radio show, show slash podcast and i know again it's on hiatus because you're focused it is on, on hiatus but yes. just so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it but just to give people an idea that it's out there and what's it about sure, sure. just give us like give me a little a little intro to the radio show sure. well the fly brother radio show is about travel and culture and so i interview people that i find very interesting that have a travel story they may be someone that works in the travel industry as a professional uh, i've had people who represent travel insurance companies who represent airlines who represent you know different destinations and they'll talk about how travel affected them from an early age and how they ended up working in that space mm, okay. or I'll talk to people who I talked to a film director from India who was one of the first LGBTQ film directors to kind of uh, well he wasn't the first but he was one of the pioneers to to put films out there at a time when it was illegal to in be India. gay in India yeah uh, I interviewed uh, another guy who had been in the military and he ended up becoming a music like a music uh, producer but it Michael was Carter. traveling Michael Carter yes mm -hmm. but it was uh, what's up what's up Mike <laughs> uh, but it was the travel that changed his life you mm -hmm. know I've talked to scholars I've talked to people who again have can talk about how 
life forming travel has been for them. And yep. so it's on hiatus right now. Um, but when the show comes out in January, actually in the run up to that later this year, we're hoping to go ahead <laughs> get and get started again with the with the show. Yeah, cool. I have one question that's kind of selfish. The question is really okay. mostly for me, All more right. than for people watching and listening, although I'm sure some of you will care if you're doing your own podcasts or, or things along those lines. Because I noticed that you're on blog talk radio, and I've seen that come up a few times. Okay. And I'm – oh, so – I'm just no. I'm curious how how you chose that as a platform versus some of the other platforms that that are out there. Okay, I didn't. You didn't. I ah, was actually my show was on a digital radio network that was oh, on Blog okay. Talk Radio. It was uh, called the Inter the Industry Entertainment. Right. Network. That's a long yeah. Uh huh. Okay. But that network has since ceased to exist. Uh huh. But that was how Blog Talk was chosen as the platform. All right. So it's not like you went out and found them and decided that that's where you wanted to Correct. be. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because and the, the reason that was selfish is I was just curious because it's come up a few times when I've been doing my own research and mm. I just wondered if I should be there as well. So anyway, Maybe. okay, seems like it's seeking you, huh? I perhaps, <laughs> perhaps I don't know, I don't know. That's yeah, I got to do a little more work there. Okay, um, let's get to the TV show. Why? What's the uh, T? The, what's that? What's the T? What's B. the T? <laughs> show. Why a travel show? I mean, oh, we, wow. we've established why travel, but why did you think and all that? Because you were you've done a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of articles on the website, your online magazine. Yes. Uh, you've done the podcast. You've been on other people's shows. So yes. why did you decide, you know what? I want to do my own travel show now. So I didn't decide. Uh -huh. Actually, it was decided for me. Interesting. Um, but I will say it's the power of image. You know, that's the that's that's why it's important. Um, I was content being a writer. That's uh -huh. all I ever wanted to be. Um a buddy of mine from college was co-owner of a very small startup television, cable television network called the Dream Network. And he was like, man, look, you've got your blog, Fly Brother, which had been out for a while. It had some traction going on. You know, it was prior to Instagram. So people were still reading blogs at the time. Right. And going to blogs for photographs mm -hmm. in a way that Instagram has now kind of, you Taken know, not over. just blogs, but... It, that was a space that we, it held at the yep, time. Yep. And uh, he was like, man, you've got a great voice. You've got a great look. You've got great X, Y, and Z. You know, we really would love, we need content. We'd love for you to do a travel show. Mm -hmm. You've got connections in the industry from having worked as a journalist for 15 years. Right. You know, and we, he, th they were very upfront saying like, we can't pay you. Mm -hmm. However, we'll give you all the support that you need in terms of, uh, you know, coaching and consulting. And we'll give you paperwork to basically be able to to make it work and you'll have a non-exclusivity agreement so if you do sell it then excellent you know yeah. and so win, again win. this was a friend a friend from college actually i was still saying no i was like no I oh don't do you're it. still saying no of course i was wait wait why of course so i had been a fat teenager uh-huh and i was at 360 pounds when i graduated high school wow I did not want to be on, on camera. camera. It didn't uh, matter how uh. much weight I had lost. It didn't matter how many years had passed. Yep. My focus was writing. That was what I knew I could do really well. Mm -hmm. Unseen. It, unseen. Physically unseen. Exactly. Right. But clearly that's not, that wasn't my path. Yeah. Um, so I could either go willingly or go kicking and screaming. So there uh -huh. was some kicking and screaming. Uh -huh. But I don't want my own TV show. I, no, you can't make me have my own TV I show. I mean, basically. I love the irony there. Uh, that's exactly but, but what it, it was. But man. I get it. Yeah, yeah. So any confidence that I might display here is a hard one ass right. confidence. Excuse my French. Right. Watch your French. And so, yeah. <laughs> and so basically the show kind of came out of that. It mm -hmm. was um, trying to figure out, you know, what my gimmick could be. Mm hmm. I, I mean, I eat food, obviously, but I'm not a foodie in that regard. Right, you were so, going to be the next Anthony Bourdain. Or, it, it, yeah. And it certainly wouldn't have been authentic for me to try to make that my thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I was looking at the types of things that I found interesting, the types of things that I did really well. Right. And the th types of things that would be compelling. Mm -hmm. And I felt at first I was like, ah, no one cares about friendship and connection. And then after a while, I was like, <laughs> you know what? That's exactly what people are looking for. Yeah. yeah. So I already write about it. Let me and I've been, you know, kind of blessed to have this global network of friends and lovers and business partners that have been pieced together through my lifetime of travel. Mm -hmm. And now we've got the technology to stay in contact in a way that a generation ago you had to, you know, write letters as pen pals or, you know, make a three dollar a minute phone call twice right. a year. Right. But like now, really, there's no excuse to not create that network. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, you know what, this 
feels right. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how the show came about. Mm -hmm. While we were, we, so we ended up filming 10 episodes in 10 locations oh, wow. for a 22 and a half minute show, which was a, what a commercial show in a 30 minute time slot would be. Mm -hmm. But the Dream Network sadly went dark while we had, we had just finished our final shoot. Mm -hmm. And so we Can, hadn't produced anything. We hadn't d done the production work yep. or the editing. Yep. But then we had a cart with no horse and that's okay. when PBS came in. Okay, so we're going to talk about that in a second because sure. I want to talk about the whole journey to PBS okay. and finding a network. And again, I'm very curious about a lot, a lot of the specifics there. No problem. But I want to come back to one of my next question was going to be, you know, what sets your show apart? And you just addressed a lot of that. Okay, you you looked for what distinguishes you, what's unique mm -hmm. to you, how can you be authentic to yourself and find something that hopefully will resonate with others. That's the friendship, yeah. the connection, that part. One thing that I liked about that along those lines is a lot of the show, and I don't know if this is still the concept, but one in one of the descriptions I read online about it was that, um, quote, actually this is a quote, I have a quote from your website, each episode centers on the personal travel style of Ernest White II as he connects, that's not the quote I wanted to read, we're going to come back to okay. that. The next quote was, <laughs> um, where is it, that you, that you, um, I can't find the quote, but the point is that you visit, um, oh, here we go, with engaging, so you connect with, quote, with engaging, enlightening people who have all helped expand Ernest's world over the years. So at least the focus this first season is on people you already know. That's correct. So I thought that that was an interesting spin versus most travel shows. They would go to L.A. and they'd be like, OK, we got to connect. Pe we got to reach out to people in right, L.A. Right, to learn right. about L.A. You're going back to these places where you already have these relationships. Yes. And so... I really liked that that angle on it, and that does seem like that would make it much more personal and give it a different spin. Well, certainly. I mean, yep. they know where the bodies are buried. They've held <laughs> my hair back over the toilet. You know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. these are bona fide friends who can call me out on my shit when need right. be. You know, and sometimes that goes into the show. So yep. I think no, the idea... I, yeah, because you sent yeah. me, sorry to interrupt, but no, you, no sent, you let me take a peek at the first episode, which I really appreciated. And I love that scene when they're holding your head out of the toilet when you were vomiting. <laughs> I thought that was a great, it's powerful, powerful television. Exactly. When they're holding it, they're pulling his hair back right. as he's just retching into the toilet. And I don't know what you had because you just went on and on and on and on. I had too much fun. Too much fun. Yeah. Okay. The show is a lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> but another thing, the quote that I just read, um, I want to come back to that. Sure. The one that I accidentally read. Um, but I, I, I like this quote as well. Each episode centers on the personal travel style of Ernest White II as he connects with familiar and unfamiliar destinations around the world. So I know that Aaron Byrne who says, quote, she has chimed in and she says, I love how you say yes mm. to things. So that's Thank a shout you, out Aaron. to you. Yep. And hello, Matthew, for joining. Thanks for joining. Um, but I know that when Aaron interviewed me on my first time that I went video here, she asked me, you know, about my personal mm. approach to travel. Okay. And we all have specific unique ways that we do approach travel so i'm just curious how would you describe beyond what you've already shared uh your personal approach to travel or your travel style I, my travel style is all about getting into the community it's getting out there and getting into the community doesn't mean necessarily that i'm looking for the most downtrodden or you know lowest income area to go hang out in nothing uh -huh. wrong with those places but it's not like you know slum An chic affected, if you sort will. of right no it's about just connecting with everybody i can mm -hmm. and so that if that means the you know the bus boy or the you know young lady that's making my coffee or whatever you know sometimes when you're especially when you're traveling in places like can uh like new york even yep. there's so much going on that people are only focused on the folks who can get them someplace or help them do something mm -hmm. that are on some level they are that they're on or higher perceived. Yep. They ignore people that they perceive as not on their level. It's subconscious. And I'm not going to say I'm haven't done it myself. Mm -hmm. The whole point though, is when I show up to a fast food window, not advocating fast food advocate or Starbucks or whatever, this is a health conscious, it's show. a health conscious show. Yeah. But I'm saying to the person, good morning. How are you? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't always remember to do it, but I will say it was beaten into me by my mother to, <laughs> to greet people. I'm glad your mama raised to, you right. My mama did raise me right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, mama. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, it's when you go someplace, it is recognizing that person as another human being. And it doesn't matter if I'm if I'm at home or traveling. Right. And so that's that's my travel style. Well, another variation sort of on that theme is, you know, when I started doing this show, mm. 
first at the radio station and, and now here on my own, so to speak. Um, you know, one of the lessons I learned very quickly, and I think this is what you're saying just in a slightly different way, is it's not just the quote unquote famous or accomplished or whatever people that are, like you said, perceived to be at a certain level who have the interesting stories. Correct. You so find story, you find some of the most compelling stories from people who don't have the platform quite right, often. Right. And then also when you make that connection, you get invited to their homes. You get invited into their world. So you're doing it to find sh- cheap accommodations. That well, is I'm not here. true. Uh, I would, okay. That's no, Matt. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> what about the name? What about the name? We haven't talked about the name. Uh, what about the name? Tell me about the name. What's the name mean? Where the name f- come fly from? Fly brother. It just. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, I feel like it's evident, isn't it? Uh, okay. So it just fl- got more evident. <laughs> <laughs> so all right. Obviously, I fly uh-huh. to places by yep. aer- aeroplane. Yep. Uh, aer- aeroplane <laughs> using jet propulsion. Uh huh. Preferably. Uh-huh. Preferably. Um, <laughs> but fly. Also comes from kind of the slang term for something that's very cool, very hip. Yep. Uh, Superfly, the pimp from the 70s. You know, it's it's black slang, something mm-hmm. that's fly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a double entendre with that. And then right. brother, you know, I'm a black man. I'm mm-hmm. a brother. Mm-hmm. And I'm also a soul brother. Okay. You know, I, I'm and I mean that in the heart centered way. Right. Uh, not the jive way. But or the both. fact that, look, there's room for. All of those things in that term. Right. You know, so let's go a little further with that term. Let's sure. let's go a little further with, with race. So you are calling that out in the title. Um, and and you're obviously an African-American black man. And is so it obvious it is obvious. I, well, although although I did read your essay where it's not necessarily obvious, depending mm, on where you are. Correct. Again. So I did my research. Um, but the, but the reason I bring that up is because one of the criticisms that we often see about the travel industry yes. and about travel journalism mm. both is that it is pretty white. It's extremely white. It can even, be. Right? It can be. <laughs> so so where does that fit into to, to Fly Brother, the efforts that you're doing and, and, and your experiences there? Um, well, I'll say this. First, the whole point of Fly Brother was to encourage people of color generally, or no, people of color very specifically within mm-hmm. the U.S. to do mm-hmm. more traveling. Okay. Now, mm-hmm. if you're a person of color who's got family and recent connections in other countries, you have many people like that, then it's not necessarily speaking directly to you. There's something I feel like that it, that anyone can get out of Fly Brother in terms mm-hmm. of just opening up and traveling. But right. it was coming from the African-American experience, which... Yes, we've always had African-American travelers, but generally it had been something that was prohibitively expensive, something that required a lot of free time that people who were just trying to get jobs and be gainfully employed didn't necessarily have. Right. And I came out of a family experience where there were certain family members who kind of looked at my travel as frivolous mm, only because mm-hmm. it wasn't something that they had experienced. Right. Um, and so it was to, and again, this was, I started the blog well before Instagram came out, before the quote unquote black travel movement was a thing in the sense of people using Instagram to kind of to get out there and travel and eventually one up each other. Mm. Back then, it was not people still felt like it was again, prohibitively expensive. In fact, some of my earliest criticisms from people were about some perceived trust fund that I had. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I have to work and all these other, like I've always had a job Mm -hmm. when I've traveled. Right. I got jobs in teaching, in the teaching sector or as a journalist in order to be able to be gainfully employed and still travel. Mm -hmm. But it was the awareness that I had that it was something you actually could do Right. That many people didn't at the time when I got started. And you chose to make it happen. Correct. Nobody handed it to you. Exactly. Right. The other thing to talk about, like to, to answer the question about like the whiteness of the travel industry. Right. It is partially because of that kind of historical, let's say, lack of access. Mm-hmm. But there's also the focus on what is the perceived market. You know, it was ignoring the African-American market in terms of travel, the, the market related to People who visiting friends and relatives, the VFR uh, market for people mm-hmm. who go back to their home countries or go to the home countries of their grandparents and that kind of thing. That's been ignored for decades in the yep. travel space, especially with regard to travel journalism. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think obviously just my very presence, you know, my presence and my voice, I'm able to speak from 
my own personal experience, but in a way that kind of bridges a gap. I can talk mm -hmm. about my experience in a way that's relatable to the people who haven't had my experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think now brands and the travel industry are starting to see the value of that mm -hmm. more than they ever had before. Um, there's still a long way to go, obviously, but now the fact that I'm not the only name out there, yep. I wasn't ever the only name, but I was one of a, a scant few small like right. Onika, the traveler. I always have to throw my girl out there mm -hmm. because she's been in the game for a long time. Avita Robinson, uh, Lola Akinmade orchestra. I'm probably mispronouncing that sounded right mostly to me. women yeah. that have been pioneers in this space as well. So yeah. I'm one of a few dudes, uh, Eric Prince, uh, Phil, the culture feel walky. I don't know his real his real name, but there's uh -huh. some people out there now that are kind of making their names known. But um, there's always room for more. Mm -hmm. And you Nate, just mentioned worldwide Nate. Sorry, no, it's okay. Keep throwing them out there. But you just mentioned what did you call it? You call it the Black Travel Movement. What did yes, you call it? Right. The Black Travel Movement is kind of this uh, a, a very large movement, mainly African American, um, that kind of got momentum with Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, mostly millennials. Again, black Americans and black people and people of color have been traveling since travel was invented. But you're talking but about visibility. In terms and, of the visibility. Organi organized. Exactly. Right. You've got large group. Uh, again, one of the pioneers in the organized kind of travel space amongst millennials was Evita Robinson with the Nomadness Travel Tribe, mm -hmm. because she was one of the first people to kind of start a Facebook group mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. it's something as simple as that. And it ended up having like 90,000 members. And out of that kind of, that was one of the catalysts, not the only, but one of the main catalysts for the black travel movement in the sense that people are aware of traveling now. They're aware that boundaries and borders are less, are, are more permeable, even as visa restrictions may go up. Um, and they're out there doing it. They're going in groups. They're taking photographs, you know, together. And again, there is some of this competition and one upsmanship that's happening, but at least people are out there. Well, that's yeah, that's a whole other issue. But I went to something with, so I saw on Facebook when I was researching for today, you, when you were at Cannes, you, you did an event or maybe more than one event with faith. I don't know how to say it like Adiele or Adiele. Adiele, yes. Adiele, you say it like that. Okay. And I saw her, she had a group of travel writers. Yes. People of color travel. There's a name, Vova? Wait, Vona. 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 Right. So Weekday Wanderlust, uh, Kimberly Lovato and Don George's group, Weekday oh, Wanderlust, yes. had Faith and her group, and they did a special event with all people, um, writers from her group. Okay. So, so Vona was, yeah. is a writer's workshop for writers of color, okay. and it touches on all different genres, fiction, poetry, travel writing, screenwriting. Okay. Uh, and so... Faith is kind of, among other things, over the travel writing section. Yeah, okay. And gotcha. uh, she's been helping people get access. That's right. really what it's awesome. about. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Let's get back to Fly Brother specifically, but I wanted to touch on that, that sure, part sure. of things. Uh, production and distribution. So, and I, you, you already touched on this a little bit, but rather than, um, actually not a little bit, you touched on this a fair amount. Rather than go to a network or go to a producer and say, I want to do a show. Um, well, actually, that's not true. They came to you. But still, <laughs> but still, because now that I know that they came to you with the show, it kind of re I have to rephrase my question. Because uh, what I was going to say is you didn't go to a channel and say, I want to do a show. You, you produced the show yourself. And that's still the case, even though you got help from this this network that ended up going under. Right. I mean, if it wasn't for my buddy Chester Jones at the Dream Network coming to me saying, I want you to do this right. and being persistent about saying that, mm -hmm. but you, I would never have done it. But you um, ended up doing the production yourself. I, yes, it I, sounds did. Like. I did. Right. I did. So that's what I want to talk about. That's sure. what I'm really curious about, because a lot of people might say, hey, you know, we've got this travel show idea. Let's let's pitch it to the travel channel. And so I'm curious what sort of the differences, what are the challenges and benefits to doing it the way you ended up doing it, even if it was sort of accidental? Right, right. Um, how, what can you tell us just a little bit about trying to, to, setting out on this on your own and then shopping it, which sure. we'll get to the shopping part. Sure. We'll get to the PBS part. But just this mm -hmm. idea of producing a show on your own before you even have a home for it, the challenges and advantages to that. Well, I'd say one of the advantages is obviously creative control. Right. You know, I was able to conceive of the whole, I, the, 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 the project and go after that vision. I worked with my production team, my cameraman slash director, Pedro Ceja, um, screenwriter and, and, and support 
Hermano Beaumont down in Brazil, people I had met a few years ago when I was living there, mm -hmm. great guys who also f had a good vision when it came to putting this whole project together. And that the freedom to do that without having to worry so much about a network's requirements right. was really great. Right. Um, also, as an outsider, it helped me because I didn't know what I could or couldn't do. So I mm -hmm. wasn't hemmed in by the rules of the whole process. So you just went for it and then exactly. deal with it later. Uh, for example, Pedro was like, why don't we just focus on Brazil? It'll be geographically easier. You know the country really well. I'd lived there for three years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so how about we do that? And I was like, no, this needs to be global. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. Just it just, gut, it, it, it gut right? Mm -hmm. um, heart. Mm -hmm. um, and so... So that's one of the advantages. One of the, the challenges had been, obviously, the financing, the funding of that's it. That's my next question. Um, so there was a, a part of it was having worked in the, in the travel journalism space, like any industry, you have connections. You have, and relationships are important. Again, mm -hmm. connecting with people. It's all and about so, who you know. Absolutely. Well, and, and, it's all, and also how you Maintain cultivate that. Exactly. And, right. and so I had gone to travel conferences. I, had, you know, I, I was just out there on the scene. I would, had met people like Spud Hilton you know, from the Chronicle mm -hmm. at TBEX, like the second TBEX ever travel blog exchange that mm -hmm. uh was in like that was in new york in like 2010 i met him just standing in line for hors d'oeuvres just by know, chance so exactly say, like and unquote, that's yeah. the kind of thing that you know you you capitalize on you save those cards you reach out to people mm -hmm. um and so that's where communication skills are so important and i'm not sure that i mean it was developed in our generation i'm not sure if i'm seeing that happen with a lot of young people. Well, now people. they just text, right? Well, and uh, yeah. Anyway, now I'm about to different get subject. Hey, different subject. Now Let's I'm turning into there. a curmudgeon, but Let's you get what I'm there. saying. The I importance totally get what is you're maintaining saying. these kinds of connections. Yep. And so, I kind of leveraged those. So I would reach out to a destination uh, in a place uh, like a destination management organization, such as a tourism board or a PR company that works for that particular destination, in a city where I knew I had friends. I showed up at. Um, the World Travel Market. I showed up at ITB in, uh, World Travel Market was in London mm -hmm. in November. Mm -hmm. ITB is in Berlin in March. I would show up to those places and walk down the aisles and interact with people. And this is <clears throat> with the goal of getting funding for the show? This, or you're just talking not, in general? If not funding, it would be at least to have Promoting the, the shoot. Show. No, it no. would have the shoot covered. It would oh. have the the accommodations taken care of, uh, possibly because the, they want the to airfare. promote their particular Correct. destinations. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And so I had a, an advertising deck from the Dream Network that I used and a little bit of cl a, a clip. I also ended up just in talking to people, people asking me what I was doing. I would find myself, not seek out. I right. would find myself in conversations with people sure. uh -huh. who were all of a sudden investors or connected to somebody yeah. who could give me a thousand dollars give me ten thousand dollars you know right. one of my first investors was um uh yo, my buddy jason best jason in the world <laughs> my brother i don't know why your name your last name is okay. <laughs> i'll come back to well, it later but part out. anyway he he just you know he invested mm -hmm. uh the the um dawa angels which are uh lady doctors they invested ten thousand wow. dollars effort. You know, so I mean like these kinds of, of, of things happened mm -hmm. which allowed us to kind of get the ball rolling and mm -hmm. get one episode filmed and then have that edited and allowed me it to use it as a sizzle Show it reel to the next, when I would right. go to exactly when I would talk to these other destinations. Right. And I think that's Going back to the beginning of that part of our conversation, sure. I think a really good point there is that a lot of these places, these destinations, they have promotional dollars or a hundred percent. Yes, whatever they do. promotional euros or yen yes. or whatever. And promotional so, pounds. Promotional pounds, and so that's something to keep in mind as well. And then, like you said, also just this fact that it becomes hopefully there's just a sort of snowball effect yes. as you. And it's also the confidence level. The more you do it, I was nervous, shaky. You know, I hated being on camera. I hated having to talk about money. I hated having to sell myself to do this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in a, because of, I've done it so much yep. that not only have I leaned into it and found the enjoyment, but it has made me just a better 
entrepreneur because mm -hmm. I still am an artist. I still create art. That's right. naturally coming out of me. But now I can sustain it and scale it thanks to people like Jason Ridgell, best Jason There's in the, the name. world, There's Yvette the name. McQueen, MD. He found it. He yes. found it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question along these lines, not specific to funding, but specific to getting your show out into the world. There are a lot of travel shows out there. Yes. And we've already talked about how yours is different. But I'm curious, as you were, before you found a home for the show, is it the sort of thing where there are so many shows out there, it's like a Starbucks, where if you find the right corner, there's the opportunity? Or is it now there are so many people pitching travel shows that you've really got to stand out? Or, I mean, inevitably you're going to have to stand out. It's got to be good. But I'm just curious because now there's the Travel Channel. I'm sure National Geographic. Certainly. I'm sure there are, I don't have cable. I'm sure there are other travel channels. So I was just curious, sort of, is the market inundated? Or, again, is it sort of the Starbucks thing where, no, no if you find the right niche, there's, there's an opportunity. I think it's the latter, man. Mm -hmm. I feel like nowadays we've got the technology to that, that's infinite. It is mm -hmm. infinite technology. Mm -hmm. you know. So you can be out there digitally at least and your audience can find you. There's only one travel channel for the moment. There's only one discovery channel for the moment. There's only right, one discovery. CNN for the yep. moment. But there are multiple news channels. There are multiple travel channels. You know, There are multiple streams. And I don't believe that I'm the only person that can tell my story the way I can tell it. Right. So if I own that, if I know I'm speaking from a place of authenticity, I'm not worried about anybody else, you know, doing me. Mm -hmm. And if you're Fair doing enough. you, you also won't be worried about anybody else doing you because it'll all line up. And yeah. I know that's I'm, I'm saying this from a place of strength now. <laughs> I didn't always necessarily yeah. feel that way. And it took me a while to get to this place. And so if you're not feeling this way now, it doesn't mean that you'll always keep on keeping on. Correct. Yeah. Eventually you'll get to that place where you recognize, you know what, damn it. Like I'm the best me. And so as long as I keep being the best me, I don't have to worry about there being a cluttered travel space or a cluttered, right. whatever space, right. because there will I, be space I'm going to exactly. Well, PBS agreed. <laughs> How's that for a segue? <laughs> PBS agreed. They did. So when your dream network, had to kind of move on to other dreams, so to speak. One hundred percent. And you had your you had your show, but you no longer had a home for the show. So, how do you get a show onto PBS? Um, it's again just kind of working out. Uh, you know what? I retract that. Retract that. Yes, I retract the um. No um. Uh, no um. Essentially, you reach out to them. How do you reach out? Do you go to the website or do you have to know somebody? Like, I, Well, it always helps to know somebody, yeah, but you can yeah. know somebody by going to the website uh -huh. and reaching uh -huh. yeah. out, finding people. Yeah. And I'm not the – I'm just starting this journey with PBS, so mm -hmm. I'm not going to pretend like I've, I understand Inside the and ins out. and outs of how yep. public television works. Yep. I do know that PBS itself is the, the distribution – it's not even the distribution channel. It's the network where you watch the television. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there are other distributors, PBS itself, American public television, NETA, which uh, does like educational programming. And they kind of are working behind the scenes to make sure that content that is created by the storytellers, the producers gets aired on PBS mm -hmm. and it's cable channel create TV. And so what you've also got are, unlike, let's say, a cable network that's generally just one stream, you've got the local PBS affiliates in each market. Yeah. And they get they vote on the programming that they oh, want really? to show. Yes. Mm. There's some shows that they produce themselves and are only aired on their particular uh you know, Local bandwidth. Yeah, right. There are other shows that some they just don't pick up for whatever reason, you know. And so being on PBS, quote unquote, you may be on a PBS affiliate on one and not be on the other. It, like you said, it's example. not like being on Amazon. Correct. You're on Amazon. You're on Amazon. Yes. On PBS, it's a lot more nuanced. It exactly. Like. Yeah. You can't doubt Abbey's on PBS. Yeah. Like yeah. big PBS, you right. know. Um, and it doesn't mean Fly Brother won't be. Right. It's just saying that um, if you're in one particular town, you may not get Fly Brother at the same time it's debuted in other places yeah. for yeah. number one. Or yeah. you may have to watch it on Create TV. Yeah. Okay. Which is the cable network. That, yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Did you try to pitch, Denny? I'm just curious if you tried to go the Netflix or Amazon routes, if that's... Uh, that was considered... 
you know, obviously everyone is trying to get on Amazon and Netflix. So curious, they're yeah. much more picky these days mm-hmm. than they used to be. Yeah. Um, the other thing is um, you can still get on Netflix and Amazon as a PBS show. Mm-hmm. So now you've got the cachet uh-huh. of being a PBS series. Yeah. So, yep. you know, it's it's there's a lot involved, but I'll say this. My advisor, Michaela Malozzi, she's got a show on PBS that's won four Daytime Emmy Awards. Oh, wow. You know, Bare Feet with Michaela Malozzi, where she dances around the world. And, <laughs> right. I mean, it's wonderful because yeah. she's connecting with people through dance. She's connecting the, the – I mean, that's just exactly what she does. She connects. And um, she has – been, she's had a journey with PBS where she's learned a lot. She's learned a lot of things the hard way, kind of just to to get to where she is right now. And so she's helped me kind of learn the ropes a bit more quickly than I would have if I was doing it on my own. And so I really appreciate that as well. Are there any other challenges? Because we kind of talked about the good thing is you you being the producer, you having total creative control, yes. you taking it to them. This is it. Are there any which you, also means, by the way, that you end, you do pay the distribution fee for PBS? Uh huh. That's a difference. Okay. Whereas so, other yeah. networks will buy your content, which yep. means that they get to, they'll either license it out, mm-hmm. which gives you a little bit of freedom yep. because you still retain ownership, or they'll buy it outright. Mm-hmm. With PBS, you end up paying, but mm. then you retain ownership, so you get the prestige of PBS. You get the ex, you know the vast kind of reach of PBS. But you got to raise a lot of money to distribute it. You do have to raise some money, but you're yep. having to raise money anyway mm-hmm. to, to actually produce it. Yeah. And you're having to raise money to market it. And so you can also look at Rick Steves. He built a whole back-end business on yep. it. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a lot of PBS. benefits. He did. He started on PBS. And so yeah. there's a oh, – I, I think he I think. started out on PBS. Yeah. He's been out for 25 years. He at least and I became well-known on Correct. PBS. Correct. 25 like, years yeah. ago, I, I would not have known what his first channel was. It yeah. Was, but, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All right. So, again, I think there's a whole other show there, just that whole process and Certainly. the nuances, the challenges, the advantages. But let's move on. Uh, I, let, let's get specific and let's talk about season one which is coming out January 2020, so January of next year, six months-ish. Uh, can you tell us about the first season? Are you ready? I'm, it's, it's <laughs> just, I'm starting to get excited about yeah, it. Yeah, it's getting and close enough. It now. is getting close enough, and it's just been a long road, man. Yeah. So. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get other people excited. All right. So tell us a little bit about the first season. Sure. Uh, so the first season touches 10 destinations. Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, I have them in my notes. Uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, yeah. Bogota, Colombia, Toronto, Canada, Cape Town, South Africa, Ovambo Land, Namibia, which is northern Namibia, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Casablanca, Morocco, Stockholm, Sweden, Tbilisi, Georgia, and Mumbai, India. Okay. Now, huge variety. It is. Mm-hmm. Um, PBS, a 30 minute time slot um, requires a show that is about 26 minutes long for PBS mm-hmm. versus 22 minutes that you get 22 and a half minutes for a commercial show. So you get a little more. So we, you do get more meat. And so because of that, we had to reimagine the first season. Mm-hmm. And so we had mm-hmm. to, because we were doing some of the episodes we did on the shoestring, you uh-huh. know, we were, right. we were doing good to get 22 and a half really good minutes sure. of like, Something that was not me swatting flies away. See, uh, okay, but, 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 but wait, let's talk so about that. So six first episodes. But the uh, first season has six episodes because of that. But that's interesting because to me, I would have thought you would have had the opposite problem, which too is much having footage? too much. Because uh, if you're going to some place like Sao Paulo, which I'm going to show a clip from that episode certainly, shortly, certainly. there's so much. I think you said it's the largest city in South America. Yes. So there's so much. And you're saying, so why was that a challenge to get enough good footage? Money. Oh, money. Oh, yes. that part I get. Oh, that's different. Okay, so you're not <laughs> saying subject matter. You're saying no, just, not just, subject uh, matter. To pay the bills to get those 24 to, minutes. Right, to yeah, stay in a place Sorry, more than two nights. Right, you know, to right, right, stay right. in a place. And that that was, kind of, okay. That's just no, startup you. woes. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like sometimes we just didn't have the resources to be there long to enough pay to, produce to the get content. a solid, compelling, you know, 22 and a half minutes. Well, because I also assume not having done that kind of film that you end up filming at least twice or three times or five times as much as you actually use in the end. What's the sort of, well, that's a, that's a good goal to shoot for. But again, it all requires a certain number of a certain amount of resources. You got to have the resources to do it. Exactly. Okay. So 
Uh, let's look at a, an excerpt from the first episode. This let's is two minute it. excerpt. Thank you very much for sharing this <laughs> with me. This is from your first episode, which again is Sao Paulo. And I'm just going to show it for everyone and then we'll talk briefly about it afterwards. So Dale. here is a two minute clip from Sao Paulo season one, Fly Brother. Fly Brother. Like you <laughs> and him. Go like Flavia leaves Pacheco and I pack into her car, cackling and conversing through the city as we work our way towards a meal at Luncheonette Cum Laundrette Cum Art Gallery Laundry Deluxe in the Jardines District. Jardines means God. God. Jardines is an upscale area of town near the center of Sao Paulo with all kinds of eclectic shops and eateries. At Laundry Deluxe, we scheduled lunch with the owner, Fabio Guia, who spent time in London and New York before opening the edgy, artsy, eatsy laundry with his two business partners here in his hometown of Sao Paulo. The food is right, then let's go. All right, let's go. With all his worldly knowledge, Fabio gave us a little insight into that famed Brazilian affability that makes this country so special for visitors. Brazilian people are so funny, happy, honest, beautiful. Look at us. A palette of colors, genders, backgrounds, interests, experiences, tastes, and opinions sitting around a table talking about the beauty of all those differences. Connection. A uh, big miscellaneous of the all of the people on the road, black, white, yeah. yellow, green, blue, Mar <laughs> Marte, Venus, all the time, <laughs> and a big liquid effector. And uh, do it, I shake, it's a Brazilian people yeah. with a big smile. Listen, Brazilian people like to kiss, like to hug, just for friendly. Not uh, interesting, like a sexual interest or love it thing. No, just for friendly. I see my friend, I big hug, I love you. Fly Brother. All right, that's a clip from first episode of season one of Fly Brother. Thank yes, you very much man. again for thank sharing you, that. Thank you. So, why did you choose Sao Paulo for your first episode? Because uh, I love that of city all so the different much. places. I love Sa Sao Paulo. Is still my favorite city in the world. And why is that? It's exhilarating. It's exciting. I had phenomenal memories made when I was in that place. Yep. It has always called me. I would like to talk about Sao Paulo. Is that you know ex spouse? Uh -huh. <laughs> that when you see it, you remember exactly why you got together in the first place uh -huh. and exactly why you ended up divorcing. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. But you're still friends. You still respect each other. No. You can still see the sex appeal, but you're also like you're crazy as hell. No, I, I, <laughs> I love that analogy because I feel a lot. I feel that way a lot about Istanbul, mm. right? I lived there for a year. Okay. There's so much that I love about it. Yes. I had so much. It was at a time, you know, right after college, before I got into the work world or whatever. Mm. So I was in that transitional space. Yes. I learned so much. I grew so much. You know, it's such a special, personally transformative yes. place for me. But now I go back and after a month, I'm like, okay, get me the hell out of here. Because then I remember all the reasons I didn't stay. Exactly. And I could have stayed. I, I chose after years. Like, you know, I think it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. But and, and I always say to your point and to this point that our relationships with places are like our relationships with people. A hundred percent. Right. And just because I don't have a good relationship with the place doesn't mean that you won't. Well, that's the other thing. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And again, our relationships change over time. Absolutely. That's the other thing. Okay. Hello, Kimberly. Bonjour, Kimberly, de, 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 de la, de, du sud de la France. Merci pour uh, nous rejoindre Bonjour. ici. Kimberly's in France, and she just tuned in. So thank you, Kimberly. Hello, Naomi and Martha and Matthew. I think I already said hi to Matthew. Uh, okay, so let's talk about, well, first of all, we're talking about PBS. Do you normally, it seems like when I'm watching PBS, there normally is like a, there's normally an affiliate station who's sponsored. Yes. Did you have to align with a particular station? Or, yes, yes. Yeah, how did that I, work? I'm with WTTW of Chicago, okay, which is one of the top out. three. It's a phenomenal group of people. I'm happy to have found a home there. Uh, they just are, the this, that's the station that is supporting the show. That's kind of, they are coming on board as producers and are making sure that the show gets out to all of the affiliates and, yeah. and they can decide to vote yay or nay and then help promote the message of connectivity that mm -hmm. we're all, that the whole world is our tribe. I mean, that's the, the purpose of fly brother and WTTW gets it. All right. So thanks. 
I still love this whole idea. Yeah, thank you. But I still, I, I'm pausing on this whole idea that the stations vote. That's really interesting. I guess it's very democratic and it is public TV. Hey, this so is I guess America. That's part of it, but God bless America. Okay. <laughs> So I'm curious, and we're going to go way over today because it's already we've already been talking for an hour. But I have some more questions that while I have you here, I'm just gonna unless you've got some place to be. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, you needed to have a better answer faster. <laughs> let's let's talk about kind of the nitty gritties of how you produce an episode. Sure. Some of, some of the nitty gritties without getting too technical, of course. But so how do you choose destinations? I guess we already talked about this. These are places you already have usually a, a past association. Well, I don't. Any other? Yes, and I don't think we talked exactly about what I do in the episode. Is this mic okay? Is it, uh, the mic is fine. All right, Thank good. You. The yeah. mic sounds nice. Yeah. Okay. Check so, one. so yeah, tell so us a little bit more about in the in every episode, yeah. I go into a city where I've got friends, and they bring me into their community. They show me the fi- the things that they enjoy about the city. Okay, what makes it special to them? Mm-hmm. And as you can see, they, they I connect that way. So it doesn't matter that there's great food and hotels. I mean, that is nice. Sure. It does matter. Sure. Hotels. Yeah. Yeah. But the idea is still the community that you build when you travel. Mm-hmm. And so I choose destinations by looking at where I've got friends, mm-hmm. where I've got compelling friends that make for good TV, yeah. where I've got a compelling location that makes for good TV, and where you know it's semi-scripted meaning i've got kind of like certain places that i know i want to go to when Mm -hmm. i did when i came up with the sao paulo episode i knew i wanted to go to vai vai samba school Mm because it's one of my favorite things to do in sao paulo and it's such a cultural institution 100 percent. right i knew i wanted to go to the beco de bachima you know i also knew that flavia leaves could talk about that's my friend in sao paulo she's the 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 travel an amazing travel uh, tour guide in sao paulo i knew she could talk about architecture in a compelling way mm-hmm. you know and that's the thing so i'm i'm also a couple to times give... you got a little bored though a couple times in that clip you kind of dozed off and she gave you a hard time and you're like i'm sorry i'm paying attention i'm paying attention and that yeah. <laughs> i mean that's basically that doesn't funny, don't though. we all do that right like that you know, even that me was, that was cute i, I could tell you guys are friends exactly to your point. because right. she could say hey right you know Exactly. I'm talking here. I'm talking here. <laughs> Pay attention, I'm which is what clock. she said. <laughs> we may be friends, but I'm on the clock. It, exactly. And yeah. that's what I love about her. That's what I love about Pacheco. That's what I love about my other friends that are in the other episodes. Like they really we just have great chemistry. And mm-hmm. part of having great chemistry means you know where you can push buttons mm-hmm. respectfully or out of love. Mm-hmm. You know? And mm-hmm. I think that translates in the episodes. Yep. Um and so trying to find a way to kind of to, to, to capture some of that, but also let a lot of it be uh, organic. Mm-hmm. And so when I went to Stockholm to do that episode, my buddy Martin was like, you're going to eat fire. That wasn't planned. <laughs> he planned it. Yeah. And yeah. I ended up eating fire. Yeah. You know, it took 50 takes. Did it really? Oh, 100 percent. Really? I, it probably took more. Did you burn yourself? No, uh-huh. but I was trying not to burn myself, which could meant have. I kept missing my mouth because uh-huh. I was like, "This is my money." <laughs> well, maker, you know what man. you need to do. You know what you need to do. Rather than because so you can see Ernest eating fire at the end of the. Uh, if you go to flybrother.net at the end of the trailer for Flybrother, yes. which I didn't play right now because it's a lot of visuals and not a lot of um, voiceovers, and I needed the voiceovers for the podcast. But at the end of that, you can see him eating fire. What you should do is produce another trailer that's the outtakes. Bloopers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the bloopers from the uh, we Trying have to Eat that. Fire. We've oh, you got do? That. We've oh, got yeah? the – well, we – We've got the footage. I don't yeah. know if we're going to produce that. I think but there's you should. that. There's the time I almost got into a fight on a bridge in Sao Paulo. Oh. I mean, we've got some interesting, interesting outtakes, outtakes. But yeah. you're only going to see things that are mother approved. Okay. Mother approved. All the mothers in the world have to be like, you know what? That's, that's, a, that's okay. a nice young man. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's a great litmus test. All right. Um, <laughs> So then with regards to what you choose within a show, it sounds as if you're already so familiar with these places that you probably already have an idea. And then maybe you probably take a little bit of feedback from your friends. About I take a lot, of feedback. Not, a lot of feedback. I take a lot yeah. of feedback from my friends. And, and even if it's the destination, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's the idea is not to do an expose. Right now, you know, if we need to show some important things that may not be, quote unquote, approved by the destination, then we we are, are tasteful and mm-hmm. we make sure that it's done respectfully. Mm-hmm. But my point is even the destination itself can suggest things and we find a way to integrate them authentically in the story. Right. You know, right. it's when people think about like authentic experience, I want an authentic experience. Well, you're not from the place, so you're already not going to get an authentic experience. I want to live like a local. Exactly. It's impossible. 
you know, but I hate that. Yeah. The idea. I get it. I get it. The, the, the spirit. But you, you're not going to live like a local for a exactly. week. And so yep. the whole point is to try to do as much of that as possible, but also recognizing that sometimes the locals do go to the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> You think? Well, if they got, <laughs> if they got friends visiting. From if they have friends out. visiting. <laughs> exactly. I only go to the Golden Gate Bridge to cross it. I oh, right. To use Gate it for a utilitarian for a long device. To now get, I just send people. <laughs> to get from one place to the other. I mean, other. after you've lived here for 25 years, you just kind of tell people, okay, uh, well, let's meet in two hours. Exactly. After you've gone I'm not to the going bridge. up Coit Tower again. I'm not going to Fisherman's Wharf. Uh, okay. What about the logistics? And so far as... You named a few people, but I'm not clear. When you go to each destination, how many people are actually with you on the shoot? There's one uh, for season one. There was one person, just one other person. Correct for season one. Now doing we're sound rectifying and that. audio, he or did everything. You... He did everything. I mean, not sound and audio, but I mean sound and visual. Yeah. So it's all just in the same. Well, I mean, we had like lavalier mics and that kind of thing, <laughs> or we had Excuse like me. the that hairy cat. On the camera uh -huh. as well. Right. That's what I was <laughs> Oh, I got like a fur ball. Me. Yeah, I think out. I got a fur ball yeah. right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was just, it's the same guy. That's amazing. But the technology he, is amazing. It's true, but he also forced me to say things multiple times, too, <laughs> in order to get... I ain't talking those 50 takes for fire eating. I mean, sometimes right. just a sentence I had to repeat in order to get several angles. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, and then what about... So pre-production... You just basically, how does that, how do you, you uh, just so, basically make a list okay, of the destinations? From, from scratch? Yeah. You have to be flexible with that too. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you're trying to work with many moving parts. It's like, I identify which friends I'd like to be in this, the episode. Then I reach, have to reach out to them to see if they'll even want to be in how the episode. How often do people say no? Rarely do yeah. they say no because they don't want to. Mm -hmm. It may be the timing isn't right. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing. Like, it has to be at a time when I can get there, when my cameraman can get there, when they can get there, mm -hmm. when we can get the destination sometime to support us. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when I mean, there's many different kind of things that have to line up in order for the episode to come off well. Yep. There's been times when one destination we weren't able to do it for season one and we can do it in season two. And <laughs> another destination has kind of stepped into place just because the inner workings of their organization were really fast, mm -hmm, you know, and mm -hmm. some others, it took a year to organize certain things. Namibia, mm. it took a year to get things organized, mostly because of their physical calendar and trying to make sure that the money was there and all that kind of stuff. But when we got there, it was incredibly organized, a tightly run ship, yep. and it was phenomenal. So, you know, it, it, whereas other times it may be just a matter of picking up the phone and like calling the tourism bureau and they've can got things up? so set up that they can just have it ready for you the next week. Right. Right. But see, and that, that's why these kind of questions are interesting to me. It's, I never haven't done anything like this. It would never occur to me that I'm going to need to wait a year to go to Namibia, Namibia because there's bureaucracy I've got to deal with because there's, all well, this behind the scenes sort of administrative stuff. It's right. not just getting on, even though I can do it with one camera and one mic, there's still a whole bunch of other administrative stuff that has to come Certainly. into place. Certainly, if you want to yeah. do it, A, legally, yeah. and B, <laughs> with support. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's that guerrilla style of swooping in, filming, right. and, and getting out. And, you know, certain places, they don't care. Yeah. I mean, even here in the States, most places, just like, whatever. As long right. as you're not, you know, technically you're supposed to be getting releases for people that show up on camera. Right. But in general, you know, there some places it's not a big deal other places it's a very big deal mm -hmm. and you know we again try to be as respectful as we can mm -hmm. and uh yeah you know when you reach out to the offices sometimes you have to work direct you work directly with the tourism bureau for everything other times you because it may just be centralized yeah other times you have to navigate both the tourism bureau and the film board yep um so yeah so what about afterwards afterwards then it's just a matter of Looking at the footage that we've got, mm -hmm. looking at the storyline that I came up with, and then finishing the voiceover script. Yep. You know, doing yep. the research, working with the tourism board, working with my friends, working with people who can give me insight on whatever topic, you know, making sure that my facts are correct. Right. Because you've got to do a lot of research. A hundred percent. Yeah. And especially just because my name's on it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I was raised. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. I... I don't like looking at programs where a lot of money was spent 
someone that's a respected scholar mm -hmm. and they're mispronouncing basic things in right. Spanish or, right. you know what I mean? Like, yep. and, and not even that they have to know the language, <laughs> but just approximate, ask somebody, how, how do I say this? No, if you're you going to reference it, 100%. do the research. I, I'm always surprised, not always surprised, I'm often surprised when when this show ends, people will say, "Wow, you really do your research," mm. and and I do, and I and I appreciate that they recognize that. But to me, it's really more about where you're coming from, which is my name is on this, and I want to do the work, and I want to know more or less what I'm talking about. I mean, 100%. I'm just spending I'm just spending three days on each episode, so I'm not going to be an expert in any of this exactly. kind of stuff. But it's really important to me to do some of that research and kind of have an idea and yeah and the pronunciations which I still butcher but of course but we, it's we different in conversation language, sometimes well exactly yeah, I mean yeah. try that's the right, whole point right. try at least put in the effort and right. that's and that's what I'm saying and yep. again I'm gonna have to say this other caveat when I was yep. talking about the PBS you know process yep. I'm by no means an expert I admit that there's so many things right. that I'm still learning right but and and I wish more people would admit that they aren't necessarily an expert mm -hmm. in some things. Be an expert at being a human being. But you know what? The other thing that I've learned relative to all this kind of stuff is a lot of times I will say, whatever the context is, related to the creative stuff. It might be my podcast. It might be online marketing stuff. It might be different aspects of creativity mm -hmm. and getting, getting our stuff out into the world. And I'll say, well, you know, I'm not an expert. And my friends will say, but you are. Now, the point is, which I may or may not agree with them, even when they're saying that. That's not the point. The point is, with so many of these things, w how do we certify whether or whether we are not an expert? The point is, do we have enough of a certain experience in a certain area to more or less know what we're talking about? There's always going to be someone who knows more. There's 100%. always going to be someone who's more yes. experienced. But, and so that idea of being or not being an expert, I think... For me, I have to remind myself sometimes that's not even the right question or the way to e the right way to even think of about course, it. Of course, of course. I know? mean, just have humility. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Recognize and, and perspective. But also rec and own your experience. 100%. And say, you know what? I have traveled to 50 countries. Absolutely. So I do know a little bit about that. Exactly. Somebody else has You're traveled a travel to 100. Expert, but and there's other right. travel experts. Right. You're not the exactly. only one. And there are others. Exactly. 100%. Right. We're on the same page there. Here we are on the same page. Okay. So <laughs> I just want to throw out really quickly here because uh, we are drawing to the end. But I want to uh, throw out to anyone who has questions about travel, about getting a show on TV, about Fly Brother, about whatever. Don't uh, ask. Don't ask. <laughs> we, he's me. changed his mind <laughs> because we've gone. No, you're going to ask. He's changed his mind. Uh, but get those questions ready if you have any. But my next question for you is uh, two questions. Sure. This is more less all the practical stuff we just got done talking about. <clears throat> what part of the show is... Making the show is the least fun. What part of the show is the most fun? Okay, so one of the many things that are that's really fun about making the show is doing the voiceover. And that's uh -huh. because I'm doing uh -huh. it. I, I record it in Bonfire Studios in Brooklyn, New York. Oh, really? With my girl TK, my buddy Conscious, and they are hilarious. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They draw silliness out of me. Uh huh. And that's you know I'm a, I am a, my name is Ernest. I'm a very serious person. Right. And I write <laughs> things seriously, but I do have a, a sense of humor that can be drawn out. And I right. love working with them because I'll say something at their prodding, and right. it will be funny, and it's just like we'll just spend a few minutes laughing. And right. so what right. should have been a thirty minute recording session ends up being an hour. Do you uh, think they're doing that just to charge you more? Do you think nope. that they have ulterior motives I, there? No, no okay. I don't. I, I'm I don't not, know them. Uh, no. I'm just throwing out that. You might want to be careful. If they're getting you to laugh to double they're your get, time there. Uh, nope, they're getting me okay. to give a better show. All right, fair enough. And, In that case, it's money well spent. Uh, exactly. <laughs> um, but I would say one of the most challenging things yeah. is to have to be watched. Mm -hmm. in public while mm -hmm. I'm filming oh, and, and while you're actually doing it while I'm actually yeah, doing it yeah. and then having to do it I, I don't like having to redo things over mm -hmm. and over and over mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. um I've got into the habit of it now yeah to the point where I'm actually saying you know is that good we can do another one so maybe maybe I don't dislike it as much as I used to right you've you've come to terms with it and have just there's a little more acceptance correct less resistance correct because it, it well you know anything you resist is exhausting mm-hmm Mm -hmm. So I guess that's what it is because I'm resisting it less. I can get through it a bit more. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. So. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. That's not something I would have identified as one of the. So again, that's why we asked the questions. And one of the one of the good things about doing this show live is I don't allow, I don't have the luxury of redoing. 
And I know. Yeah. And that's one of the things. That's okay. Well, no, no, no. It's good. Yeah. Because otherwise, the perfectionist in me, yes. I would be doing so many takes and it already takes so much time and effort. And so sometimes, you know, friends will say, well, do you really need to do it live? And I like doing it live because, you know, we've got some people here and we can get some questions and we have one question that's come in. Um, but one one reason, other than the fact I like doing it live for other reasons, is I can't redo it. And I know yeah. that that's good. Just yes. knowing how I work and wanting to it get it exactly the right. Yoke of expectation exactly. and perspective. Perfection. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Okay. Uh, is there a season two? There is a season two okay. that we are currently filming. Okay. So and stay tuned. Can you tell us uh, where yet? Or is that too, are we too soon? You don't want to divulge anything too like soon. that? Okay. Too soon. Have you identified all the places or are you still trying to figure that We're, out? We have not solidified all, all the places, but yep. we have a few kind of working through the the machine there and we're ready to, to go ahead and get out there. So if you're doing a season two already, does that mean PBS has said we want season two or are you just i'm not at liberty to speak to that. okay not allowed to speak to that that's probably a good thing though that's i don't what know i'm guessing but i don't know okay here's the question it I may have. bomb and they may not want well that's what i was kind of Black assuming Brother. that part of it is probably dependent on how the first season goes of course right, right. okay um but that doesn't gonna, mean that i can't film a season two and it can't exactly. be on some Someplace other else. Exactly. exactly right but that's not gonna be a problem because it's gonna be, gonna be successful on pbs I, your mouth to god's ears my brother God's listening. God's listening. I don't, we don't have to point up anymore, right? We've realized God is everywhere. Okay. <laughs> I want to talk about something in closing before we get to the questions, because um, this is something that's been on my mind a lot lately, and it's something that you've already spoken about publicly. And like I said, I, you, so this is over tourism. You were in a, a documentary, like I said at the beginning, called uh, Gringo Trail. Yes. And it's the subject matter Peggy being vale. over tourism. Peggy sorry. Vale. She's the director. Okay, sorry Peggy Vale. For the so name drop. don't be sorry. Name drop. No, no, no. Give her credit. No. Peggy Anybody Vale, is... Melvin Estrella, two amazing filmmakers in New York. They okay. were at Cannes. Oh, they supporters were. Supporters of the Pavillon Afrique. Yes. Ah, formidable. Okay. Venice is completely overrun. Hmm. Barcelona, certain sections, certain neighborhoods getting completely, the locals can't live there anymore. You walk around certain sections of Barthel Bar Bar Barcelona and <laughs> and you you see the, the they've got... Um, Banners hanging on, on the uh, God, I can't think on the balconies mm -hmm. saying "Tourists go home, tourists, you're you're causing us a lot of problems." This, that, and the other. Recently, here when we had the super blooms in different places in California, even so close to home, and kind of a different variation on this, where we had these fields of wildflowers, s little towns were getting shut down by the traffic, right? Mm -hmm. So this over tourism, tourism, w we talk so much about how good it is in so many ways, and of course it is, and I believe that yes. in so many ways, and. I've traveled all my life too, big part of my life, and yet I'm becoming really, and not just I'm becoming, but we are becoming more and more aware. There are certain places, certain things that are really just getting out of hand. Certainly, Does that come into play when you're figuring out where to go at all? So one, I'm typically going to places that are not necessarily the main tourist They're already attraction. off, more off the right. beaten track. Some of them. Yeah. Cape Town is you know the picture postcard of South Africa yeah. and it's it's beautiful but I will say they also have the infrastructure to receive lots of tourists mm -hmm. and so that's one thing right um Sao Paulo on the other hand you know it gets lots of business travelers but now it's kind of it it, it, it every few years has a renaissance in the in the travel space but people always still go to Rio and and Salvador and Iguazu yep. Falls and all that kind of stuff yep. um so <clears throat> going there going to Casablanca you know, um, even Stockholm, mm -hmm. you know, it's a beautiful place. It still gets a, a fraction of the tourists that, you know, Berlin and, and, and Paris and Madrid and Dublin and sure. London get Rome yeah. um, and so Prague even. Mm -hmm. And so oh, especially yeah. Um, yeah. the so on one hand, I'm I don't feel like I'm necessarily stoking tourism in that regard. Mm -hmm. What I want, it, it's not fair for me to tell people they can't go. Right. You know? Right. And I, it's not fair for me to tell people they can't go during their two weeks of vacation time. Which coincides with everybody else's exactly. two weeks, perhaps. So that's, you know, it's great for us to be indignant about these things, but I'm from a touristy place. I'm from Florida, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah, it's annoying when people are driving slow in the left-hand lane of the freeway looking for waffle house but or at the up same highway time, one in northern california which is two lanes not using the turnouts 
Oh my god, that drives me insane. But you know, people <laughs> are crap drivers everywhere. No, right? but the turnouts. <laughs> I don't even know what a turnout. Okay, is. so a turnout is when. <laughs> okay, have you been on Highway One at all? Because you just moved here. Yeah. So Highway One is like it snakes okay. up the coast. Okay. And so it's two lanes, and it's all curves. Okay. Well, if you're a tourist and you're not from here, you might be scared of the curves, and you might want to enjoy the amazing View. views. Yeah, yeah. I totally get it. I totally respect that. Just don't but, throw your flashers on in the middle of the No, lane. but the point is there are special lanes since there's o- there are very few opportunities to pull over. There are special lanes to do that so that locals can get by. Okay. And so when people who are doing that, they're going 20 miles an hour, and mm. I'm, sometimes that is literally what they're doing. And they don't take the, the the turnouts. It sends me over the edge. I understand. Over the edge. I understand. I have, you have road some place rage. To be. Well, or I don't have some place to be, but I just drive Not faster on those them. roads because exactly. I'm <laughs> over there all the time. You know, I'm, I want to go 35 instead of 20. It's not like I'm not even necessarily in a hurry, but I don't necessarily want to go 20 miles an hour on my road. Right. Anyway, did not sp- intend to spend 10 minutes on that subject, but clearly. I've been in Marin all week dealing with this, so it's a very recent, recent phenomenon. Okay, Matthew, but we got to get you some help. My I need help, <laughs> please. I need but help. Just yeah. to kind of to address that, I feel yeah. like education and awareness. Yep. You know, the idea is to get people to think about, like, you know, what if you have an opportunity to go in the off season, mm-hmm. you know, then do that because yeah. I am sure Venice and Barcelona don't want to do without the income. That comes in from being tourist hotspots. They say they don't. They say they could do without it. But that's actually a bigger conversation, too, because Venice is much different because it's cruise ship largely. I mean, there are lots of people who aren't cruise ships, which doesn't bring a lot of money versus Barcelona where yeah, okay. people are and, staying. And, I, and obviously, you know what? And I am not an expert right, on right. these particular topics. But point but being, they do say, want tourist dollars. Certainly. I mean, you, yep. th- you would think they would. Yeah, they may they may actually see how they can be sustainable without it, and that's, that's the, something that's something for that jurisdiction. But no, 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 general, no, no, no. I don't. Sorry if I can interrupt. No. I think the question isn't to be sustainable without it. The question is how do you find some sort of happy medium? Education, where you're bringing in the tourist money because you want the tourist money, but you're not decimating entire neighborhoods. So obviously, it's yeah. it, you, first you have to look at how the tourists are even going there. Right. You know, if it's cruise ships, then Venice needs to be having a conversation with the cruise lines. Right. If there's a, you know if there if it's you know, airlines that are given cheap fares to Prague or to Berlin or whatever, you know, then it's talking with those airlines. But at the same time, then you're starting to police the free market. That's that's the tricky part. And so for me, and this is the last thing I'm going to say on this, sure. so we're going to go to questions because we're at an hour and a half. Uh, but so the reason I bring this up, too, is because it's personal. And for me, it's not about necessarily being indignant, but it's, it's about caring. So I have a 25 yes. year relationship with Barcelona. Right. So, uh, you know, and so I. I no, but seriously, like we I, talked about. I mean, about, is it because you're old? That's part of it. That's definitely part of it. <laughs> I got I've no. I went there in high school, right? I've been going so. uh, right. Okay, but po- point being, I was just looking, you know, about going there for a month. Yeah. Well, every single place that I found on Airbnb was obviously a vacation rental. It was not like when I just went to Paris. I stayed in someone's apartment. They lived there. She went to her boyfriend's. So I knew that I wasn't, you know, now. All of these, and so I'm. But you have that awareness. You could tell based on your experiences that one was a lived-in place versus right. one that was rented out. And right. the other thing is, who's to say in five years that place that she was staying in won't be? And so, and so, I'm not saying I've place. come up with the solution. Yeah. I'm just sort of highlighting kind of the struggle. I want to be sort of aware. But point being, I didn't go to Barcelona because I didn't see a way this time in this season because it's high season and it's a very last-minute thing to do that and I just couldn't be one of those people and again just like you said a second ago I don't want to discourage anyone to go Barcelona it's a lovely place I mean that's why I've gone back so many times over and over and over again but I just knowing what's going on in these neighborhoods and seeing the signs on the on the balconies and things and going in peak season and having to stay in one of these places that I know is at the expense of someone who used to live in that neighborhood I couldn't do it. I could have probably gotten a hotel. I mean, there, there are alternatives. There are other ways I could have gone. But since I like to go someplace and hang out for a month, I didn't really want a hotel experience. Anyway, much bigger well, conversation. But Well, and I think also, I mean, when you look at it, the same as going into parts of Brooklyn or Harlem. Oh, very much. Or and you, you know, going yes. to restaurants and places where you're paying a lot of money, much more than what the person that had been living close by would it's ever afford to be able to pay, yes. you know, for a meal. Like, yep. We're always doing things that if we actually looked at the chain of affect 
if that's a concept, Sounds we good. may n- we may not choose that yep. action. You know, we may not choose to do that if we realize that this is somehow displacing somebody. Right. But we're doing it all the time. Yeah. Anyway, so I guess it's just to try to do the best you can. Be aware. Make choices like you did, which was to go someplace else. Your Barcelona is going to be all right. And you're going to be all right <laughs> by not going to Barcelona in the summer when you planned it. Right. You can go on the off season, pump money into the economy, you know, pay less. Except I'm cheap, but yeah. Huh? I said, except I'm cheap. They, Barcelona well, doesn't get a lot of money from me, but some, some. But you're cheap and demanding? I'm cheap and demanding. <laughs> I'm the worst kind of visitor. Okay. Let's go to question because, like I said, we're at an hour and a half okay. here. Uh, Aaron says, Ernesto. Through PBS, which is an inside joke, Ernesto, PB, <laughs> based on my mispronunciation, not my mispronunciation, but my combining two names. Through PBS, do you have access to international distribution, subtitles, etc.? cetera? Um, I do believe that that is something that's available. Okay. So, And we do have digital distribution, which is accessible outside Anywhere. of the United States. Correct. Yeah. Very exciting. We are so out of time, completely, unbelievably out of time. But the reason for that is because it's been such a great conversation. So thank you very much for sharing your whole journey to date and um, or the parts that we were able to cover in 90 minutes at least. And we're all looking forward very much to Fly Brother in 2020. Thank you, man. Six months from now on PBS. If you're a local PBS affiliate, vote yes. Vote yes on Fly Brother. And uh, let me just throw the links here, uh, flybrother.net, as I said earlier. But then also, if you want to know more specifically about Ernest, ernestwhite2.com is a site um, with a lot of his writing and other stuff that he's done in addition to Fly Brother. In so, the process of being updated. In the process of being updated. So, as so, we all are. As we all are. As we all are. Okay. Thank you very much, Ernest. Thank you, Matthew. I appreciate it. All right. Very much. Thank you. And thank you, audience. Thank you, audience. Thank you, listeners and viewers. All right, that's all for today. Thanks again to Ernest, Fly Brother TV show, show producer and host. That, again, is Ernest White II. No show next week, but the following week, my guest will be author Rachel Howard, like I said at the beginning of today's show. Thanks to Wordspace Studios for hosting me. They, again, are at wordspacestudios.com. And as I also mentioned at the beginning of today's show, If you're local to San Francisco this Wednesday, June 5th, from 7 o'clock to 8.30, Erin Byrne, who we've mentioned a few times as she has chimed in and is the one who just gave us the question. Thanks again, Erin. She and and, uh, Patricia Rareg, who is the visiting writer in residence here at Wordspace Studios, Erin and Patricia will be in conversation about Paris, about literary Paris, about their um, vignettes and postcards in From Paris book, and much more from 7 to 8.30, again, this Wednesday, June 5th. So if you're local, stop by. Thank you for watching and listening. If you like the show, please share on social media and subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen or watch. It is imperative to getting the word out and for the ongoing success of the show, and I really, really appreciate it. For more about me, my website is matthewfelix.com and links uh, to to basically everything. My social media, my uh, books, my other podcasts, and all the rest can be found there. If you have any comments, ideas for the show, or just want to say hello, you can contact me at felixonair at matthewfelix.com. Thanks again for watching and listening, and have a great week. <laughs>